We're going to close off the study of Colossians this evening, and we are on chapter 4. Last week we had studied chapter 3 into chapter 4, verse 1. So we're going to continue tonight with the rest of chapter 4, continuing with verse 2. And usually at the close of a book, it's usually just final stuff that I've spoken about. Um, sometimes a repetition of certain things, final exhortations, and then final greetings and instructions. And Colossians chapter 4 follows that specific pattern. In verse 2, Paul says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And so right here we are seeing obviously the, the need to be consistent in our prayer as believers. And Paul says here we ought to continue earnestly in prayer. Prayer ought to be a regular part of our lives as believers. It ought to be deliberate, it ought to be purposeful, and it ought to be a part of our daily routine. It shouldn't be haphazard. You know, some people it's only on certain occasions or special occasions or if they are nagged or forced that they pray. But Paul says here we must continue earnestly in it and we must also be vigilant. Three of these words, continue earnestly and vigilant regarding prayer here are indicating how serious and consistent the lives of believers ought to be where prayer is concerned. And he said, be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving here to God for life, for everything he affords us on a daily basis. In verse 3 he says, meanwhile praying also for us. And us here is the apostles, those who are out there evangelizing. That God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. Recall that he's writing here from a Roman jail. And he's asking that they also pray for the believers so that the word of God can have opportunity to be shared and to spread among those who had not heard it so that they can be empowered to speak the mysteries of the gospel of Jesus for which he had been persecuted and was now imprisoned. In verse 4 he says that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. And so here we see where he is reiterating that he is duty bound to proclaim the gospel. He is duty bound to preach the word of God. It is his obligation to make manifest the truths of the word of God. And he instructs believers, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, those who are unsaved, redeeming the time. You know, sometimes believers can walk foolishly with those who are outside. Sometimes we want to live like them, we want to do what they do. We entertain certain conversations and looseness. Paul say you mustn't do that. Sometimes we share certain private matters about the church with them and that creates a hindrance for them to come to church, to submit to the Lord and the gospel. So he says to walk in wisdom toward them. And of course, wisdom here is the right application of knowledge. Knowing when to speak, when to say, when to do. Having that depth of experience so that you know when to chat and when to shut up. And when to say no, when to say yes. Yeah, absolutely, copy. When to say no, when to say yes. Believers need to exercise wisdom. Certain matters you can't discuss with everybody. No matter how, how sweet the joke may be, based on what it may give off to the unbelievers, you can't laugh at it. No. 
depend on the nature of it. That's what it means to walk in wisdom toward them. You have to study the time. You have to redeem the time and, 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 and seek to apply yourself in such a way that you become a salt to the world. You become one who practices and lives the gospel and make it easy for others to embrace Christ. So he says, let your speech be always with grace. Very similar to walking in wisdom here. Let your speech be graciously seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. That means it mustn't be tasteless. It must be tempered. Absolutely. Copy, you're speaking well tonight. <laughs> You know, sometimes, boy, we just, we're loose cannons. And it's just not, not just members, you know, even from, from the pulpit to the pew, from minister to the parishioner. Sometimes some people just don't have a good possession and control of themselves and their spirit. And they don't study, know how to mind work and influence and all of these different things. And avoid certain things and do certain things. Sometimes people are emboldened in certain sins and practices because pastor did it or elder did it or missy sister Merla do it missy Kapia did it so it must be right for me to they, they, they use us as examples to, to make it seem like it's alright and so Paul says you know we we have to be cautious how we speak to people we have to ensure that we know how to answer, how to respond. Which means our words must be properly chosen and selected. They must be deliberate. And when we speak, we must ensure that we are speaking in ways that wrong impressions are not given. And you know, brothers and sisters, one of the hardest things James talks about is the control of the tongue. James chapter 3. He so said, you see, if you can control your tongue, you can control everything else. <laughs> because the tongue, man can't tame it, you know, only you can tame it. Even if they lock you up in a, in, in, in a, in a, in a six by seven jail cell or whatever harsh conditions they want to put you on. If you want to talk, nothing can make you stop talk. Unless they inject you with some way, your muscles just can't work. All of that beating you to death. If you want to talk, nothing will stop you from talking. Because <laughs> you want to talk, nothing can control the talk. And I'm sure you've seen some movies where to stop someone from talking, they cut off their talk. And even then, they still try to talk. So we're seeing here the absolute necessity to control the tongue. Control how we speak to others. Control the kind of words that proceed out of our mouths. And so Paul, as it were, a final exhortation tells the believers, watch how you talk, especially to those who are not a part of the faith. In verse 7 he says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, he will tell you all the news about me. And so when he comes to them, he will relay what is happening with Paul in jail. He said, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your heart. So he, he's sending Tychicus to them, that they may be updated about their circumstances and be comforted in spite of what the apostles were suffering. He says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who's one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, he greets you. With Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now what's interesting here about Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, yeah, he's the same Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark, John Mark. In the book of Acts, when Paul had initially met him, Mark was, he was timid, he was scared. He didn't, he didn't want to face persecution with them. And so he, because Paul noticed that about him, Paul, Paul didn't want him to come with them. Paul rejected him initially. And so Barnabas took him 
and Paul took Silas as his missionary partner. But over the years, Mark would have matured and grown. And here, Paul is commending him that they receive instructions about him, and if he comes, they ought to welcome him. And we can learn a lesson from this, you know. We ought not to write people off. They might be in a stage in their life where you might not be able to work with them. They're not the person who's best suited to work with you at this particular time. But over time, they might grow, they might mature, and they might be suitable. And this here was Mark's experience. And so he says, I give you instructions about him. If he comes, you are to welcome him, you are to receive him. So, you know, sometimes, you know, as I say, certain times in your life, some people aren't the best to work with. You have to let them go their way and you go your way so that there may be growth and fruition. But as they show maturity, as they grow in the Lord, as they prove themselves, then you can work with them. And so we shouldn't write people off totally is essentially what I'm saying. Watch them and observe them and let wisdom dictate how you proceed in reconnecting with them and communicating with them. And even in, as you can see, the church and gospel ministry, we ought to operate like this because Paul was a leader. John Mark was also a leader. He wrote the book of Mark. He was Peter's disciple. But notice here, Paul couldn't bother with him. He's inexperienced and can't suffer. He's a mama's boy. And, and he, 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 needs, he needs his comforts. And, and Paul is running up and down city to city, getting run, getting persecuted, and all kind of things happening. Mark couldn't handle a hard life. So Paul said, I can't bother with you. You're, you're a hindrance right now. But Barnabas is his cousin. So Barnabas took him. Barnabas understood Mark's constitution, how him stay, and he worked with him. Until Mark could have been groomed and matured. And when Paul met him again, he's a totally different person. And he's able to commend him and recommend him. And was now willing to work with him. And oftentimes we have to operate this way. Sometimes for our betterment and the betterment of others, we, we have to part ways. Even in the body of Christ. Now for you say if... That the person is a pastor and I'm a pastor, we must work together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, still, so, not everybody has the same mindset. Not everybody has the same views. Not everybody has, has the same convictions. Not everybody has the same drive about ministry. And so you have to be selective in who you work with. Because some people, instead of helping you to go forward, they can hold you back. You know, and it happens in ministry. All of these things can happen. And so we have to be very wise and selective as to how we proceed. In verse 11, he says, and Jesus, who is called Justice. By the way, there are many Jesuses in the Bible. Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus. That's the Hebrew and the Greek. It was a very common name. Uh, so they, this guy here was a Jesus who's called Justice. He says, these are my only fellow workers. For the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They were Jews. That's what he means. They were of the circumcision. They were Jews who had embraced the gospel. And they were working with Paul. And he says, they have proven to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a Colossian, a bond servant of Christ, he greets you. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Epaphras here is far removed from them, but he's constantly praying for them that they are perfect, they are mature, they are complete, that they are whole in the will of God. So we don't have to be in proximity to be of help. Our prayers can do a lot. He says, for I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you. And those who are in Laodicea and those who are in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. This is the same Luke who wrote the book of Luke as well as the book of Acts. Paul says he greets you. Demas as well. Demas was 
another fellow work of Paul who sent his greeting. In verse 15 he says, Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea. And this is the same Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, the lukewarm church. Laodicea and Colossae were in close proximity and they shared similar, similar experiences, social setting, circumstances. The church was close like, like Pondside and, and, and Brownsville. And so Paul says to greet them. He also said a Nemphus and the church that is in his house. A Nemphus and his house here is a manuscript variant. Other versions have um, Nempha and the church that is in her house. And so it could be Nempha was a male or a female and the person had a church in their house. In the New Testament era, they had house churches. They weren't like what we have now. We have a specific building. These were house churches. The families and persons who were converted, they gathered and they worship in a house. And there are many places and countries, especially China, where Christians cannot have public buildings. Christians cannot worship in the open. They're persecuted. They, they go to jail. All kind of bad things happen to them. And so they have to have house churches. They worship in secret. And there are some parts in America where they are returning to that model as well, house churches, because they're finding it costly to maintain buildings with no people in it. Because, you know, you know, to maintain the building, rent, and all kinds of stuff, the various bills, and so they find it easier to just move away from the mega churches that are too costly and just have house churches. And it's working for some. And who knows if a time of persecution comes where we can't be in the physical building, we have to worship in our houses or wherever we can in, in a solitary place. And so the church, churches in the New Testament era were always in people's houses. There was always a stark difference between the synagogue, which was the place of worship for Jews, and the church. Church and synagogue, two different things. Churches were in believers' houses. And synagogues were specific designated public areas for Jews to worship. They, they were usually close to bodies of water. Because Jews did a lot of purification rites. And so they were always tried to be close to water, like a river or something, where they have easy access to water. In verse 16, Paul says, Now when this epistle is read among you, this Colossian letter here, he says, when you read it, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And so the Laodiceans were to read this epistle because a lot of the things that Paul says here and the circumstances that the Colossians were in the Laodiceans seem to have been experiencing similar things and they would also be benefited by hearing this letter. Not only that, but also he says that you likewise read the epistle from the Laodiceans. So he had written to the Laodiceans too and that letter obviously did not survive. He had written to them as well. And he says you also read their letter. So it was kind of like letter swapping. They both needed to hear and understand and be blessed by what he had said to each of the churches. So after they would have read their letter, they sent it on to Laodicea. When the Laodiceans read their letter, they would send it on to the Colossians. This is very, very profound here. And he says to say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. So, so Archippus here, seem to have been a person who wavers easily or, or forgets his calling and mission. It doesn't say it explicitly, but it can be deduced by what is said. Because here they have to encourage him to ensure that he fulfills the ministry he received from the Lord. He ought to, they ought to encourage him to Remind him to fulfill it, to walk in it. If that is the case, then obviously it, it seems to suggest that 
he was a kind of, you know, forgetful person or laid back. And so he needed a nudge. So he says, y'all nudge him that he fulfills his ministry. And some of us can be like Archippus, where God called us for quite some time and, and we know <laughs> he has called us and we dodge, we're, you know, we're, we're laid back, we're lazy and we don't want to walk in our calling and ministry and something or someone has to propel us so that we can walk in it. And that's not a bad thing. It's always good when we can inspire and encourage each other to fulfill God's call in our lives. Because I have discovered that when we are not walking according to our calling, we feel empty, we <laughs> like feel miserable, we feel like we a waste time, and you're not comfortable. It is when you're walking in what God has, has called you to do, you feel fulfilled. There is that intrinsic motivation. You have to do it because, like Paul says, you're duty bound. This is what brings you joy and fulfillment. And so Archippus here seemed to have been wavering with his ministry. So Paul says, you all need to nudge him, push him, inspire him, encourage him so that he may fulfill it. And sometimes we need the same nudging and pushing. When we get discouraged when we are wavering, when we feel like we want to give up, somebody has to remind us, God has called you and given you a ministry. You need to fulfill it. Stop wasting your time. Fulfill your ministry. And as we close in verse 18, he says, This salutation by my own hand, which means he signed the letter by my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. A very short and profound letter, brothers and sisters. So many different aspects of life, of theology, of faith in Christ, of social life, of church life that we saw from the letter from chapter one through to chapter four various things and i hope that although we are two thousand years away we can continue to glean facts and truths from the inspired word of god and continue to live them out the word is not dead you know it's not just for them it's also for us application ought to be made so that we can walk in God's will in the same way that they did. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for coming out tonight. And I hope that the word of God was a blessing to you. Continue to study. Continue to take your Christian walk seriously. Continue to make use of the times that may be available to you to pray, to get involved in ministry, to see how you can avail yourself for God to use you to be a blessing to the community and to faithfully serve him in whatever he has laid upon your heart to do. God bless you.